6.6 .6, L'Hopital's Rule. Let's consider some limits that we're familiar with, such as limit x approaches 0 sine x over x. How about something even simpler like x approaches 1 limit of x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. How about limit as x approaches 2 of f of x minus f of 2 over x minus 2? And of course, these should be familiar limits. We know that this first one is 1. We know that this second one should be the limit as x approaches 1 of x minus 1 times x plus 1 over x minus 1. And since we're approaching 1, that means we don't actually reach 1, which means we can delete those x minus 1 factors. And this reduces to limit x approaches 1 of x plus 1, which is 2. Uh, this last one should look familiar to you. In general, what's the limit as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a, that's just another formula for the derivative of a function at a. Now more to the point, when you look at each of these examples, what happens when you try to directly plug in the x value, the a that you're approaching, into x in the function in both the numerator and the denominator? In the first case, you get sine 0 over 0, so you get 0 over 0. In the second case, when you put in 1, you get 1 minus 1 over 1 minus 1, again 0 over 0. Even in this last one, when you plug in 2, you still get 0 over 0. So in each of these three cases, if I try to evaluate the limit by substituting the x value that I'm approaching directly into the function, in each case, the top evaluates to a 0 and the bottom also evaluates to a 0. So in general, if I'm trying to take the limit as x approaches a of a quotient, and let's say the limit as x approaches a of the numerator, and the limit as x approaches that same value denominator are both 0, then what we call this is an indeterminate or indeterminate form. Indeterminate in the sense, if I try to evaluate this limit by just substituting a to get f of a over g of a, and those both end up being 0, that doesn't really tell me much about what the value is. Uh, for example, in this case, when I got 0 over 0, the limit was actually 1. Here it was 2. Here it would be whatever the derivative of the f function is, which could be lots of different values depending on what the function f was. So getting values of 0 for the top and the bottom for f of a and a g of a is really indeterminate because it doesn't tell me much about what the limit of that quotient is. Okay, so the question is, is there a more general way to determine limits of quotients of functions that are indeterminate in form of this nature, this 0 over 0 form? And the answer is yes, and that's L'Hopital's rule. So let's take a look at L'Hopital's rule. And depending on what textbook you're looking at and how the author chooses to break down this theorem, it might come in two or maybe even four versions. Um, I've chosen to lay it out here in two versions, and you can see in each version there are something like two subcases. So that's where I'm getting this uh, essentially four cases. But let's just go ahead and uh, talk through the theorem. We're not going to prove these. Uh, 
the proof of the basic L'Hopital's rule requires something called the Cauchy mean value theorem. Um, we could probably tear into that here and figure it out, but it's uh, usually more in the province of an advanced calculus class. And given the time constraints we have, we that we have here, it's probably not the best thing to spend our time doing. So let's just get right to the theorem this time. So L'Hopital's rule, x plus a form. So let's go ahead and read what it says. Uh, f and g are two functions that are both differential, differentiable on an open interval, uh, interval i, except possibly at the number a, which is the, uh, the number we're going to try and approach in our limit. So we have two functions differentiable on some open interval, except possibly at a, somewhere in the interior of that open interval. And what's the other thing I'm going to suppose? That for all values in that interval, the derivative of g is not 0. OK, with those assumptions, the next thing is if one of these two is true, that is, the limit as x approaches a of f and g are both 0, or the limit as x approaches a of f and g are both infinity. So here's the key part, the first thing to notice. The limits of these two functions have to be the same thing, either both 0 or both infinity as x approaches the number a. If one of those is true and the limit as x approaches a of the quotient of the derivatives of f and g, so f prime over g prime. Notice here I am not saying f of x over g of x prime. I'm not talking about the quotient rule. I'm talking strictly about the derivative of f over the derivative of g. So again, if one of these two is true, and then the limit of the quotient of the derivatives as x approaches a equals the number l, so a real number l, then the conclusion is the limit of f divided by g is also equal to l. In other words, we can determine the limit of f divided by g by looking at the limit of f prime over g prime if both functions, that is f prime and g prime, both, I'm sorry, both f and g both go to zero or both go to infinity. Okay, real quickly, let's look at the second version down here. The only difference now in this second version is that I'm listing it as an x approaches infinity form. So now, notice now it says, and it sounds sort of like the theorem above, suppose f and g are functions differentiable for all x greater than n. Okay, so now it's not differentiable on some open interval. It's differentiable for all values larger than some big n. In other words, still differentiable on an open interval, but it's an open interval that goes to infinity of this form. Okay, so f and g are differentiable basically for sufficiently large x is what this part says. f and g are differentiable for sufficiently large x. And suppose that for all sufficiently large x, g prime is not 0. And that sounds just like the condition up here in the other case. Then if one of these two is true, and notice again, it's the same two cases we had up here. Either the limits of these two are 0, or the limits of these two are both infinity, except do you notice now x is approaching infinity. Up here, x was approaching a number. OK, so to recap, if f and g are differentiable and non, and g, is, g prime is non-zero, 
for sufficiently large x. And the limits of f and g are both 0 or both infinity. Then if the limit of f prime over g prime is L, then our conclusion is the limit of f over g is L. When you put these two cases together, what do you get? You get that if the differentiability conditions are right, and I'm trying to investigate either the limit as x approaches a of f of x over g of x, or the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x over g of x. If both of these functions go to zero or they both go to infinity, then I can look at the limit as x approaches a of f prime over g prime. If that limit exists, so let's say if this limit exists, then we may conclude that the limit as x approaches a of regular f over regular g is also that same number l. Same thing over here, same exact scenario, only difference is I'm approaching infinity instead of approaching a. And so again, if both of these functions both go to zero as x goes to infinity, or both go to infinity as x goes to infinity, and the limit of the quotient of the derivatives is L, then we can conclude the limit of the quotient of the functions is that same number L. So the first thing we might ask is, does L'Hopital's rule apply to those limit situations that we looked at in Calc 1, for example, limit as x approaches 0, sine x over x. So, of course, what's sine of 0? It's 0. And of course, when I substitute 0 in the bottom, I also get 0. So I would definitely call this a 0 over 0 indeterminate form. And again, what I mean by that is, when I try to evaluate this limit by substituting 0 for x, I get a ratio of 0 over 0 which is undefined, of course, but in the limit sense, I don't really know where this is going. It depends on the nature of those functions. Well, in this case, L'Hopital's rule would say what? As long as the top function and the bottom function are both going to zero or both going to infinity, then I can simply look at the limit as x approaches zero of the derivative of sine x over the derivative of x, and that limit of those derivatives, or that quotient of those two derivatives, will be equal to my original limit, provided this limit exists. Now, what happens if this limit doesn't exist? It doesn't tell me anything. If this limit of the ratio of those two derivatives of those original functions doesn't exist, this original limit may or may not exist. So let's just say if I calculate this limit of the quotient of these derivatives and I don't get an answer, I get something that does not exist, then I have no conclusion. But in this case, of course, when I evaluate uh, this function at 0, I get cosine of 0 over 1, which is 1. What about limit x approaches 1? x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. L'Hopital's would say, let's look at the limit x approaches 1 of the derivative of 2x minus 1 over the derivative of x minus 1, which would be the limit as x approaches 1 of 2x, which is 2, which is correct. Now, of course, we can start looking at functions we've been dealing with in chapter 6 here, such as the exponential function and the log function, and this is where L'Hopital's rule is useful for us right now. If I start looking at limits like 
limit x approaches 0 of x over 1 minus e to the x. Well, I don't have a real, a very good intuitive grasp yet of how x behaves compared to something like an exponential function. That is, I would expect this limit to be 0 if the denominator was getting smaller, faster. I would expect this limit to be perhaps infinity if the top was growing a lot faster than the bottom. But of course, neither one of these might be outpacing the other in such a dramatic way. In fact, in this case, first of all, let's make sure we actually have an indeterminate form here. When I plug in 0 to the top, I get 0. When I plug in 0 to the bottom, I get 1 minus e to the 0, which is 1 minus 1, which is 0. So when I apply L'Hopital's rule to take the derivative of the top and the derivative of the bottom, I get this limit. Notice that when I evaluate the bottom at 0, I get minus e to the 0, which is minus 1. Looks like the limit is minus 1. Okay, let's look at another example, sort of in that same vein. Let's look at limit x approaches 0 from the right of ln 1 over x over x. Let's see. Obviously, the bottom is going to be 0 if I just try and substitute 0. Okay, what about the top? What is the limit as x approaches 0 from the right of the ln of 1 over x. Well, I know that as x approaches 0 from the right, 1 over x approaches infinity. If I think about the graph of 1 over x, I know that as I approach 0 from the right, my function approaches infinity. Okay, so that means as x approaches 0, this 1 over x that's sitting inside that log function approaches infinity. If this number inside the log function is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, then what's happening to the entire log of 1 over x function? It's also getting larger. This entire limit is positive infinity. All right, so what sort of form would I say this limit has? I would say it's a infinity over 0 form. And the question is, is that indeterminate or not? So think about that. If you have a ratio where the top of that ratio is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and the denominator is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. What happens in a fraction when the denominator gets smaller and smaller? The entire fraction tends to get bigger. So this numerator is trying to make this entire ratio bigger and the fact that this denominator is getting smaller and smaller is also tending to make this entire fraction get bigger and bigger. So actually it turns out that infinity over 0 and 0 over infinity are not indeterminate forms. They are determinate. Infinity over 0 is tending to infinity. Okay, what about 0 over infinity? Well again, in that fraction the top's approaching 0 in a fraction, when the bottom gets bigger, the entire fraction tends to get smaller. That means what's happening in the numerator and denominator are both tending to make this ratio arbitrarily small. So make a note of these two. These two are not indeterminate forms. Infinity over 0 leads to a limit of infinity. 0 over infinity leads to a limit of 0. Alright, what that means is
when you look at this example, we said that we had an infinity limit in the top and a zero limit in the bottom. And then we said down here, that means the limit is infinity. So the answer is infinity. So I'll just write that here for your reference. The answer is positive infinity. But the real upshot here is if you pay attention to what L'Hopital's rule says, it says to apply L'Hopital's rule for L'Hopital's rule to be valid, the limits of the numerator and denominator have to be the same. They both have to be zero or they both have to be infinity. This is an example to show you when not to apply L'Hopital's rule. If the limits, limits of the top and the bottom are not the same, L'Hopital's rule does not apply and in fact will probably give you a completely different answer. So be on the watch for this. Uh, this is the sort of question that could be mixed in another group of questions as a misdirection. Be on the lookout for both of these forms. Okay, let's keep going and look at some more examples. So here's an example of something else that will happen sometimes. So I'm going to look at limit x approaches infinity. So now we're doing a, a limit as x approaches infinity. And by the way, when I say infinity, I do mean plus infinity. If I don't write the plus or minus, it's implied that I mean plus. So let's look at the limit as x approaches infinity of x times ln x. And actually for this problem, I'm sorry, I want that to be zero. Let's say x approaches zero from the right. I'm looking at the next problem for the limit x approaches infinity. All right, so what form does this have? So let's see, this time it's a product, and I can see that x approaches zero, this part will go to zero. Okay, what about the limit as x approaches zero from the right of ln x? Well, we know what that should be. It should be negative infinity. So this other part in the product has a limit of negative infinity. So I would say this is a zero times infinity form. All right, so the question is, what, what does that give you? Well, again, this, this is also indeterminate. Um, here's a really simplistic example. If I think about something like limit x approaches 0 from the right of 1 over x times x, well, of course, again, as x approaches 0 from the right, this function approaches positive infinity. This function approaches zero. So this is another infinity times zero form. But what is this? This is simply limit as x approaches zero from the right of x over x, which is one. So the fact that these two different functions have limits of infinity and zero um, could actually lead me to a situation where the limit of the product of those two functions is a constant. And you should be able to see that by adjusting these functions a little bit, I could change this number to almost anything. In fact, any number I wanted. So this is really, again, indeterminate because the fact that these two functions go to infinity and zero doesn't really tell you which one is winning. And again, what I mean by that is if one of the functions is getting arbitrarily large and the other is getting very, very small, the limit could be 1, it could be 0, it could be infinity, it could be 52. How would it be infinity? Well, the function that has a limit of infinity in the product would have to be growing a lot faster than the other functions trying to decrease to zero or have a limit of zero. How could the limit of the product be zero? Well, the function that has a limit of zero is tending to zero in a much more aggressive way than the function that's trying to get big is getting big. So the fact that one of these has a limit of infinity and the other has a limit of zero doesn't say much about what 
the combination of those two in that product is going to give me. It really depends on the nature of those two functions. So I guess what we're saying is when you say something goes to infinity and you say something else goes to zero, understand that this function that's going to infinity could be going to infinity in a lot of different ways. Very quickly, very slowly, or some other speed intermediate to very slow and very fast, whatever those are. Same thing for the zero. It could be approaching zero very quickly, very slowly, or at any other speed. When you take the product of these two, it's those speeds, let's say, at which these two functions are approaching their limits that determine the limit of the quotient or the product of these two. All right, so here's the thing, though. You should notice that zero times infinity, well, in our case, what was it? It was x times ln of x. Do we agree that that's the same thing as ln of x over 1 over x? And do we agree that's also the same thing as x over 1 over ln of x? And you can see that I'm just reciprocating one of the two factors to make it a division. And notice that when I do that, I've, I've played a little trick here. Now I see that as x approaches 0, this is approaching negative infinity. And actually, you should notice now this is approaching positive infinity. Now, I don't care that one's negative and one's positive. The important part is these are both infinities now. Notice down here at the bottom we have the same thing. As x approaches 0, this approaches 0. And as x approaches 0, 1 over ln of x also approaches 0. So in this case, it's an infinity over infinity form. In this case, it's a 0 over 0 form. I can apply L'Hopital's rule to those forms. So, here's the suggestion I'm giving you. If you're taking the limit as x approaches 0, or whatever number, of the product of two functions, and one of them's going to 0 and the other one's going to infinity, try to reciprocate one of them. If I reciprocate this one, then I can make it an infinity over infinity. If I reciprocate this one, I can make it a 0 over 0. Which one should you reciprocate? It doesn't really matter. Uh, but if I am able to choose one of these two, I think this top one is a little nicer. Remember, I'm going to try and take the derivative of the top and the bottom in that fraction. I don't really like the looks of the derivative of 1 over ln of x. It's doable, but uh, I think limit as x approaches 0 from the right of ln of x over 1 over x looks a lot better. All right, so again, as x approaches 0, this goes to negative infinity. This goes to positive infinity. That means I can apply L'Hopital's rule. So how does it work? I take the derivative of the top, which is 1 over x. I take the derivative of the bottom, which is negative 1 over x squared. Okay, notice if I simplify that, I actually get limit as x approaches 0 from the right of negative x, which is just 0. Okay, that says the limit as x approaches 0 from the right of x times ln x is 0. Okay, here's a quick easy one. Uh, as promised, let's look at an example of a limit with x approaching infinity. So let's say limit of ln of 2 plus e to the x over 3x. And as x increases, you should be able to see that the ln of 2 plus e to the x is also increasing. That is, increasing without bound. The limit of the top is infinity. And obviously, the limit as x approaches infinity of 3x is also infinity. So I can immediately apply L'Hopital's. 
and take the derivative of the top. Okay, what's the derivative of the top? Well, it should be the derivative of 2 plus e to the x, which is e to the x, over 2 plus e to the x, over the derivative of 3x, which is 3. Of course, that's just limit as x approaches infinity of, let's say, e to the x over 6 plus 3e to the x. Okay, now this is an easy example, but it illustrates something very simple. Sometimes we might have to do several iterations of L'Hopital's rule. That is, apply it more than once. Notice that we could apply it in the beginning because this was an infinity over infinity form. So we applied L'Hopital's rule. When we simplified the ratio inside that limit, we got this. Notice now that when I look at the limit I've got left, the limit of the top is infinity and the limit of the bottom is also still infinity. That means I should be able to apply L'Hopital's rule again. So let's see, if I did it again, what would I get? Well, you should already be spotting something. When I take the derivative again on that denominator, I'm going to kill out that remaining constant term. I'm going to get limit of e to the x over 3e to the x, and I can plainly see that limit is one-third. All right, so this is an example to show you that for many problems, you may have to do L'Hopital's rule two or perhaps three times in succession. Now, I will say as a rule of thumb, if you start doing, let's say, three iterations or more, and it seems like you're not getting anywhere, uh, chances are you're probably not going to get anywhere. Uh, you can definitely get yourself in a cycle or a loop where you just keep generating indeterminate forms over and over again. Uh, there are various tricks for trying to get yourself out of those loops. Uh, those are more creative situations that we're not going to deal with much in here. Uh, there might be a couple of those in your homework, and we'll talk about those when they come up. But uh, as a rule, we're going to keep the applications fairly simple here. But there will certainly be problems where you need to do L'Hopital's rule, let's say at least twice, like I did in this example. Okay, let's look at another example. Um, so here we have limit x approaches infinity, so another infinite limit, or limit at infinity, of x over x minus sine x. Okay. Let's see, what's the limit? Is it infinity over infinity? Well, the top is definitely infinity, no, no doubt about that. The bottom is x, which is getting arbitrarily large, minus sine x, and of course sine x is just alternating or oscillating between negative 1 and 1. Okay, so can I make this function arbitrarily large by making x large enough? And the answer is yes, which means the limit of this denominator is also infinity. Okay, so this is infinity over infinity form, which means I can use L'Hopital's. So let's see, if I do that, I get what? 1 over 1 minus cosine x. Let's see. What does that give you? Obviously the top is 1, so already I suspect something strange is going on because if I was going to apply L'Hopital's rule again, I would need 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. Okay, so this is not a problem where I'm going to apply L'Hopital's again. So the question is, do I actually have a limit here? Well, if the top is 1, when I plug in infinity on the bottom, I guess the question would be, What's the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 minus cosine x? And you should be able to tell me that that limit does not exist. Now notice the difference between that limit and the limit I was asking you about over here, which was the limit of x minus sine x. Even though the sine x is oscillating, 
this x is so large that these little fluctuations when x is very large don't affect this x very much and I am still able to make that x as big as I want and keep it as big as I want for a sufficiently large x. Okay, in that case that means the limit's infinity. In this case over here, uh, the limit doesn't exist, and I don't mean infinity, I mean it just doesn't exist because it never gets to and stays close to any value. The limit's not 1 because obviously as x changes, subtracting the cosine x will move me away from 1, back towards 1, away from 1 as the cosine function oscillates. So really this function never gets close to anything and stays close to anything. So the limit does not exist. Okay, which means when I tried to apply L'Hopital's rule, I actually did not get a limit. Now the question is, does that contradict L'Hopital's rule? Well, actually it doesn't, because what does L'Hopital's rule say? It says, if under the right conditions, and of course we haven't been quoting the, those for all these problems, but we're talking about those different differentiability conditions in the theorem and that is part of the reason this function has a problem um, if the limit as x approaches let's say infinity of f prime of x over g prime of x equals l then the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x over g of x also equals l and that's precisely the, the logic in the statement of L'Hopital's rule. Well, that's not violated here because the limit of the quotient of the derivatives doesn't exist. The theorem says if the limit of those, that ratio of those derivatives exists, then the limit of the ratio of the original functions exists. That logic is not contradicted, or that statement's not contradicted, because the limit of the quotient of the derivatives doesn't exist. The only time I could get a contradiction of L'Hopital's rule, which I'm not ever going to get because L'Hopital's rule is true, is if the limit of f prime over g prime was equal to L, and then somehow the limit of f over g was not equal to L, then I'd have a problem because that would contradict L'Hopital's rule. So this is an example to show you that just because you apply L'Hopital's rule, um, you may not actually get a limit. And if you get a limit, if you, I'm sorry, if you don't get a limit, as in you get some does not exist type answer, what does that say about the original limit? Well, it actually doesn't lead to any conclusion. You, you can't tell anything from that. I will tell you, though, that... Uh, if I look at limit x approaches infinity of x over x minus sine x, it is actually a limit of 1. And I'll let you uh, think about it, about why that's true. You can use calculus 1 methods to come up with that. So the point is that limit actually does exist, but when you try to apply L'Hopital's rule, you get a does not exist limit that does not imply that the original limit does not exist, so don't make that logic error. Okay. So at this point, let's talk about other indeterminate forms. So what indeterminate forms do we have so far? Well, we have 0 over 0, and we have infinity over infinity. Now, let's be careful. Uh, what did we say 0 times infinity was? Well, we said that could be written in 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity form by reciprocating one of the two factors. So if you wanted to, you could add that to the list. You could say 0 times infinity is another indeterminate form although it's really just a variation of either of those two. But uh, if we want to make a thorough listing, looks like so far I've got those three cases.
Okay, so let's just go through a few forms here and think about just for a moment, are these determinate or indeterminate? So if you think about infinity times infinity, and they could be positive or negative, I don't think it's too hard to talk yourself into that limit being an infinity. If this is growing larger and larger, and this is growing larger and larger, the product should be growing larger and larger. Okay, so this is, let's say, determinant. Zero times zero, of course, that one's obvious. That should be zero. So if I'm doing a product of two functions and they have the same limit, that's fairly trivial. The only one that gave us a little trouble was a product of two functions, one, zero, one, infinity. And then we had our two ratios where the numerator and denominator were both the same kind of limit, same form, both zero or both infinity. Okay, what about infinity plus infinity? Well, we could prove this with a delta epsilon proof, but if we just use a little sense here, this means we're getting bigger and bigger. This means we're getting bigger and bigger. If we add two things that are both growing arbitrarily large, the sum is also growing arbitrarily large. Okay, so no problem with that one. Okay, what about infinity minus infinity? Well, for that one, you don't have to think very far. If you just think uh, at a very simple level, let's say polynomial level, if I were to look at x cubed minus x squared and ask what's the limit as x approaches infinity of that, well, you would say infinity. Of course, if I turned it around, then of course that would give me negative infinity. Now that already tells me that just because I have a difference of two infinities, uh, I can switch it all the way from one end of the number line to the other just by reversing them. That certainly sounds like this is an indeterminate form because whether this is plus or minus infinity depends on which one of these two functions is growing faster. Now as it turns out, this infinity and minus infinity form could actually be any other number on the number line. That is, the limit could be 1, or it could be 0, or it could be 32. And we'll see some examples of that later. So infinity minus infinity is another indeterminate form, and I'll show you an example of, of that and how to handle it here in a second. Okay, there's a few others that aren't so obvious, so let's list those quickly. Um, 0 over 0 is indeterminate. Infinity to the 0 is indeterminate. And 1 to the infinity is indeterminate. Now again, remember what I mean there. When I say 1 to the infinity, I'm not saying that's something you can actually punch into a calculator and evaluate. I'm saying 1 over infinity form as in, I took the limit as x approaches something of a function raised to another function, and the limit of the base function was 1, and the limit of the function in the exponent was infinity. And you'll see in your homework that, again, depending on which one of these is trying to approach its destination faster, let's say, that's going to govern what this limit is. And in that sense, it's indeterminate because I don't really know what a limit form of 1 over infinity leads me to unless I know something about the behavior of those functions and how those behaviors compare to each other. And that's also true for the infinity to 0 and the 0 to 0. Now, if you're looking at all those forms I've listed, um, there's one you might be asking about, and I'm thinking about uh, that one right there. What about zero to the infinity? That's the one I haven't listed there. Well, if you think about what that says, it says what? You're raising, let's say, f of x 
to the g of x, and you're saying the f of x function is getting close to zero, so very, very small, and the g of x function is getting very, very big. Well, if you take something that's getting arbitrarily small, so let's just think in terms of a simple progression like one half, one fourth, one eighth, one sixteenth, and then you raise those very, very small numbers, numbers that are getting smaller, to a power that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, you should be able to see that that limit is definitely zero. Okay, but if you think about this one, and I'll let you mull that one over yourself, that one I can't apply that same logic to. This one, the infinity to zero, really is indeterminate. It does depend on, again, is the base function or the function in the exponent doing its thing faster? And by its thing, I mean, is the base function trying to approach infinity more dramatically, or is it the exponent that's trying to approach zero in a more dramatic fashion? And it's the, the tug of war between those two functions that determines the overall limit. All right, so if you think about that list that I put up here in the corner, that is the list of indeterminate forms that we need to be able to deal with. And we've already done several examples of those two and even that one. We know the trick for that third one also. So let's look at one for that fourth type. So let's look at limit x approaches 0 of 1 over x squared minus 1 over x squared secant x. Okay, first of all, let's verify that this is actually an indeterminate form. So what I have to think about is what are the limits as x approaches 0 of 1 over x squared and 1 over x squared secant x. Well, of course, as x approaches 0, 1 over x squared approaches positive infinity. In this bottom limit, as x approaches 0, of course, secant of 0 is 1, which means, again, this is really acting like 1 over x squared, or, or getting very close to 1 over x squared as x approaches 0. So this is another infinity. That means this is definitely an infinity minus infinity form. And if there is a limit, its value is going to depend on the strength of one of these functions in terms of its, its growth rate, which one is getting bigger faster. All right, now the approach here is really simple, and it, it probably should be pretty obvious what your first step should be. Uh, most of the time in algebra, when I see the difference or sum of two algebraic functions, my first thought is to try and combine them. And so in this case, if I combine them with a common denominator, of course I'm going to get secant x minus 1 over x squared secant x for my common denominator. Okay, let's take a look at that. Now this looks like a limit of a fraction. So my first thought here would be, is this a 0 over 0 form or an infinity over infinity form, to which I could apply L'Hopital's rule. Now let's see, secant of 0 is 1, so the top is a 1 minus 1, that would be a 0 form. The bottom is 0 squared times secant 0, secant 0 is 1, so this bottom is 0 squared times 1, that's 0. This is a 0 over 0 form. Okay, that means I can try L'Hopital's rule. And so this limit we're looking for will be equal to the limit of the ratio of the derivatives of those two functions, if that limit exists. All right, what's the derivative of secant x? It's secant x tangent x. The minus 1 disappears. Now on the bottom, I have a product product 
which means I'll need to do the product rule. So that would be 2x times secant x plus x squared times secant x tangent x. I can definitely reduce that to limit x approaches 0 of tangent x over 2x plus x squared tangent x. Now, I'm stuck with another ratio, and of course, uh, based on my experience so far, as I'm going down through the checklist, the next thing I should probably check is this another indeterminate form to which I could apply L'Hopital's rule again, or do I actually have a limit here? Well, if I just evaluate numerator and denominator at zero, uh, you're going to see that again I have a zero over zero form. Tangent of zero is zero, and in the bottom both of these terms also evaluate to zero. All right, so that means I could apply L'Hopital's rule a second time. So let's say now this is the second application of L'Hopital's. Limit x approaches 0 of derivative of tangent, which is secant squared, over derivative of the denominator, which would be 2, plus, okay, I have another product rule there, it'd be 2x times tangent x plus x squared times the derivative of tangent, which is secant squared. Okay, let's see. Uh, yet again, another ratio. Uh, probably not much that I can do there to simplify. So again, we're at the point where I should try to evaluate the top and bottom at zero to see what I've got. In the top, I've got secant squared of zero, which is one. In the bottom, I've got 2 plus, now let's see, this part here would be 0. This part here would also be 0. So it looks like I've got 1 half. It looks like the limit is 1 half. So if I apply L'Hopital's rule, even if I have to do it two times, let's say, like I did in this example, if I can eventually get a finite limit, then that is the limit of that original ratio that I started with. But that ratio was just the simplification of that difference. So what this example shows you is what? If you have an infinity minus infinity form, you should try and combine those two fractions that are giving you those two limits into one fraction. If that fraction ends up being an indeterminate form 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity to which L'Hopital's rule applies, then you try L'Hopital's rule. Okay, what that leaves us is the other examples that we talked about, these very strange ones, 0 to the 0, infinity to the 0, and 1 to the infinity. And notice in each case, we are talking about limits of the form f of x raised to the g of x, where the f and the g are doing what we see in these three forms. And so there is one technique that covers all these three types, and so we're just going to do one comprehensive example just to show you the technique. And then uh, you can refer to this example, and it will cover any other problem of this type. So let's look at this example. Let's say we're looking at the limit as x approaches 0 from the right of x plus 1 raised to the cotangent of x. Now obviously the limit of the base is just 1. And the other question would be, what's the limit as x approaches 0 from the right of cotangent x? Well, if you recall, your cotangent graph looks like this. And as I'm approaching 0 from the right, my function is approaching infinity.
Okay, that means this is definitely a 1 to the infinity form. It's one of these three. All right, so here's the technique, and it's fairly straightforward. And I am going to write it a little differently than he does it in the book. Uh, the way I'm going to write it is, is sort of an old school style. Uh, but you're, you're free to write it in any way that is logically equivalent to this or makes sense. But uh, I think when I do it this way, you'll see exactly why the method works. And then from there, you can adapt it uh, to your own style. So what I'm going to do is take this limit, x approaches 0, of x plus 1 cotangent x. And I'm going to write the inside, the argument of that limit, as exp of ln of x plus 1 to the cotangent x. So if you notice what I'm doing there is I'm basically putting an exp and an ln together. And of course what happens when I put an exp and an ln together, then of course they just cancel each other out and what I get is that function right there which means I haven't changed a thing. I've just rewritten the function in a strange way. Notice that's equal to exp, and again, by exp I mean the e to the x function. We said a long time ago that since that exp exponential function is continuous everywhere, in this composition of exp of ln of that function on the inside, that exp can be pulled outside the limit. And so I'm going to say we're going to take that exp outside the limit and it's going to be e raised to the limit x approaches 0 from the right ln of x plus 1 to the cotangent of x. So if you're with me so far, what I did is took our function basically inserted an e to the ln of that function, which really didn't change anything. Now I've taken that outer function in that composition, which is the e to the x function, and I have pulled it outside the limit. And again, the rule I'm using there, just to write it one more time, is if I take the limit as x approaches a of f of g of x, and f is continuous at g of x, then you have an old rule from Calc 1 that says that's the same thing as f of the limit x approaches a of g of x. And so in this case, the f was the exponential function and the g was the ln function. Or the, you know, let's call this something else and let's call that h of x. And then what I'm doing is just taking the f outside the limit, which in this case means taking the exp outside the limit. All right, now look at what you have inside the brackets. Let's just look at that part for a minute. Let's look at limit x approaches 0 from the right ln x plus 1 to the cotangent x you see that I can pull that cotangent x down now because of my power property for the natural log. So I can certainly take that power, move him down as a multiplier, and when I do that I end up with limit x approaches 0 from the right of cotangent x times ln x plus 1. Okay, now, it's a limit of a product, so of course to go any further I need to know what I'm working with, so I need to think about what form or forms do I have for each one of those factors. Well, what's the limit as x approaches 0 from the right of cotangent x? Well, that's that situation we talked about up here. As x approaches 0 from the right, cotangent x approaches infinity. So this is positive infinity. As x approaches 0 from the right, what does ln of x plus 1 do? 
Well, it approaches ln of 1, which is actually 0. So actually, this is a 0 times 0 form. I'm sorry, an infinity times 0 form. And if you can think back a page or two, that was one of our indeterminate forms. That's the one that if I reciprocate one of the two functions in that product, I can always convert this to a 0 over 0 or an infinity over infinity. And both of those I can apply L'Hopital's rule. Which one should I opt for? It's the one that proves easiest in terms of the algebra or the differentiation involved. Well, I'll ask you, which one of these looks better? Is it ln of x plus 1 over 1 over cotangent x? Or is it cotangent x over 1 over ln x plus 1? Well, either will work, uh, but if you're looking closely, you know that this guy right here is just tangent. And so my real choice is between ln of x plus 1 and over tangent x versus this one up here, which is cotangent x over, well, there isn't much I can do with this one other than maybe something like ln of x plus 1 to the negative 1, but that doesn't really make the derivative any nicer. So either approach will work, but uh, the obvious one here that's a little cleaner is this one. It just makes the ratio nicer and the derivatives will be nicer. That's really the thing I'm after. So I'm going to let's erase all this. And so let's call this limit x approaches 0 from the right of ln x plus 1 over tangent x. Okay, so if I apply L'Hopital's rule, let's just confirm one more time that L'Hopital's rule works. And we know it should, because we said if we flip one of those two, it's going to change it either into 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. Well, let's see, if I plug 0 in the top, it's ln of 1, which is 0. If I plug 0 in the bottom, that's tangent of 0, which is also 0. Looks like that works. Okay, so L'Hopital's rule would say what? Let's take the derivative of the top and the bottom. Well, the derivative of the top would be 1 over x plus 1. And the derivative of the denominator there, the tangent x, would be secant squared x. Okay, what does that give me? I suppose we can write that as limit x approaches 0 from the right of 1 over x plus 1 times secant squared x. If you don't like that, we could say limit x approaches 0 from the right of cosine squared x over x plus 1. Is this determinant or indeterminate? Well, if I plug in 0, the top would be cosine squared of 0, which would be 1. And in the bottom, I would have 0 plus 1, which would be 1. This limit is 1. All right, now let's take stock of where we are. What is 1 if you follow it all the way back to where we started? It was this guy right here. Okay, where did that come from? It's the limit of the ln of your original function. Remember, this was your original function. And this limit we've been working on here is the limit of the ln of the original function. So if the limit as x approaches 0 of the ln of the original function is 1, then what happens when I exponentiate both sides of that equation?
which means raising e to both sides, essentially. Well, the right side is going to be e, and the left side is going to be the limit as x approaches infinity, I'm sorry, 0, of exp of ln of the function. Well, what happens to that e and that ln is they cancel out. And what I've got is the limit as x approaches 0 of my original function is e. So let's talk through the general process here just so you can see it one more time. If I'm taking the limit as x approaches a of f of x raised to the g of x, and when I do that, I get one of those aforementioned indeterminate forms. So infinity to the 0, 1 to the infinity, or 0 to the 0. Then the trick here could be summarized like this. What I'm really going to do is look at the limit as x approaches a of the ln of my original function. By original function, I mean f of x raised to the g of x. So what I'm doing is inserting a log into that limit, and now I'm going to take the limit of this function. Okay, what happened there was you ended up with the limit as x approaches a of g of x times the ln of f of x. Now, if one of these is a 0 and the other one's an infinity, then that means this could be converted into a 0 over 0 or an infinity over infinity. Okay, it doesn't matter which one I choose, so let's just say I go with ln f of x over 1 over g of x. And let's just say for argument's sake that that ends up being a 0 over 0 form. From there, I will apply L'Hopital's rule. Okay, let's say I've done that, and let's say I get that the limit is x approaches a of g of x times ln f of x equals, let's say, l. Do you all see that the answer to my original limit question, well, since the limit we just found here is the limit of the log of the original function, I need to raise that limit, or raise e to that limit, to get rid of the log. So I'm basically undoing the log that I inserted. Okay, but why did I insert the log? It was so that I could pull that g down to play my L'Hopital's rule game. Once I've got this limit, the idea is to take the log back out. Well, how do you do that? You raise e to that l. And that's exactly what I'm doing when I say let's take exp to this limit x approaches a f of x to the g of x. Because what you're really doing is, I'm sorry, ln of f of x to the g of x. Because what you're doing then is moving that e of xp back in. so that they cancel each other out and you're back to your original limit. So, just to say it even simpler, what we're really doing is taking the limit of the ln of our function, say we get l, then our answer to the original problem is e to that limit. And that's the process. Okay, so when you get to this, make sure you ask questions if you're not sure how to get yourself through this process. If we need to go over a couple of these in, in our meeting, we can do that then. Okay, we'll stop there.